US Men's National Team goalkeeper, Matt Turner. It's so good to have you with us. Thank you for coming through. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited. I'm yeah, excited. we're excited. Um, I guess goalkeepers, one of the things they always say about goalkeepers, right, is that they're cut from a different cloth. Did you get on with keepers in your career? I mean, no. yeah, but they're always, <laughs> man, they're always, I like keepers that want to stay late and, and take shots, for sure. Okay. I've been, been there. The game, I used to be that. I got along with keepers, you know what I mean? You, you gotta, were you were that. I, I mean, still, still. I like to stay after, you know, but I'm getting old now. Nah. 29. So. 29. 29. Now for a keeper, you know how it You can play into your 40. Go ahead and play into your 45, man. I like to say, I think I'm like probably the most normal goalkeeper out there. Oh, really? I actually, yeah. I Who's actually the believe that. Uh, phew, the weirdest? Either Bobby Shuttleworth, he was the first goalie I ever saw where I was like, oh my God, that guy's crazy, or Aaron <laughs> Ramsdale. He's also bananas, that guy. Yeah, he's fucking weird, but I love him. Crazy in what way? He's just eccentric, you know? He's um, got little bits of uh, a flair in his game, and he just, he's, he's very opposite from me in that, in that sense, you know, on the field, off the field. Um, Are you too normal? Yeah, probably. It's, but maybe because I'm so normal, that makes me weird, you know what I mean? Like a little reverse, <laughs> or reverse type What are his thing, weirdisms? So. His weirdisms, I like that from you. Uh, he just, I don't know, the, the tongue out thing. Um, he just, he's always just like trying to do something. He always wants, you know, the way he walks around the training ground, he's got his little mug of tea and he's always trying to do something or have That's some fun. That's just what we, we drink tea. Yeah, I know, but I just, you know, put it in like <laughs> I mean, a, a to-go about, cup, you know. He said <laughs> about you that you're unintentionally, you, he said you're the funniest person on the team, but it's because you're unintentionally funny because of your Americanisms, right? So is that a like, compliment or not? It's like a backhanded compliment. Yeah. No, so, I think like he, I think he realized he was giving me a compliment and then tried to be like, oh, unintentionally. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because I think I'm a funny, like I'm a pretty funny guy. I'm witty, you know, I understand what's going on. I'm self-aware. I think that's like a huge uh, proponent, but uh, dude. Spoken like a true goalkeeper. I know, but uh, yeah. But I he did know. that whole kind of, he did the impression of stuff that you would say, like to when Kevin De Bruyne went and spoke to the ref, okay, and he yeah. was like, so that was relax, like, dog. Yeah. It's a dog bite. Yeah, <laughs> I took some inspiration now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you know where I'm half, from, half, dog. <laughs> half of that's true. He added, an, there's an extra dog in his impersonation. Okay. So, but. Which uh, is the true, huh? What did you say? I did say, it's a dog fight out there. Okay. I said it's a dog fight. You didn't say relax, dog. To to uh, De, to De Bruyne. De Bruyne. Oh, you said yeah. De Bruyne. And Jack Grealish, by the way, both of them, and they both looked at me like, what? <laughs> and I was like, mm. and you know what? And that's the kind of thing. Like, that didn't get back to Aaron in any other way other than me telling him. So after the game, like, I had a good game, a pretty good game. We lost. It was whatever. We got back the next day. We're training, and we're just, you know, every, the emotions have settled a little bit. We're on the bus again or something, and I just like turn the music down a little. And I'm just like, guys, I gotta, I gotta tell you guys something about the game yesterday. And they're like, what, like, what could it possibly be? And that was the story I told them. So basically, Rob Holding and uh, Erling Holland like both went up for a 50-50, and I'm pretty sure it was like a head-to-head. -head, so they stopped the game. And our, whenever the play stops, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but everybody on our team like goes over to the sideline to sort of get instruction. And as I'm walking past. Uh, you know, Grealish and De Bruyne are complaining to the referee, so I'm just like, I just said, chill out, man, it's a dog fight out there, you know? Like, I just let it out, and they just looked at me funny, you know? And I just, so I told them that story, and they were all loving it, they were cracking up, so, I don't know, that's me. I'm, I'm American, I don't try to be anybody else, so. We would've killed you in the locker room, too, for that. I, exactly, that's what I'm saying, it's not just, it's not just an English thing, you know? Hey, we'll see, we'll see in a few years if you pick up an accent, because I noticed some goalies, they start to pick up some accent. Yeah. Guzan. Have you, have you got, uh, like, Friedel? Can you yeah. do a British accent? No, nah, not really. It's not really in my He's locker, not a goalie, to be honest. But he I've, been, I've been here for so... Those guys went over when they were younger, so I guess I can kind of see it. Goose was the craziest experience of my life, though, because we were in Gold Cup together in 2021, and I'll just be... I was having a normal conversation like this with him, and it was like, as soon as he puts that mouth guard in and steps over the white line, he becomes full-on British. <laughs> and I was like, I can't even understand him anymore. <laughs> it was funny, though, yeah. I don't think I have that in me, though. Well, how are we going to see if we're going to bring him back? We're gonna yeah, see. mark that. We'll what see about, about Ramsdale? Can you do a Ramsdale impression? Nah. No? I, I stay away from impressions, okay. you know? I, yeah. If anything, he just sticks his tongue out all the time. You know, anybody can do that. My son does that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
You know how important like visualization is for professional athletes, right? Did did you ever see yourself getting to that point, knowing like how late you came to this, like that the head start that everybody else had on yeah, you? Yeah, I never looked at it as a disadvantage. I always looked at it as an as an you advantage. You thought you would be I, playing in the Premier League. I like not at first. Like, I always kn knew I could play one in MLS. One college offer you knew? Like, man, yeah, I'm going to make it Arsenal, one. bro. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. I can I see always, it. Fairfield to Arsenal. I, Easy. Yeah, I actually <laughs> <Say less>. knew. <laughs> <laughs> I actually knew that uh, I could play in MLS because I would go watch the games at Red Bull Arena. And um, I just would watch the games and think to myself, I can, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that. So, but for me, my biggest, like, inhibitor was the fact that I had no experience. I had no cred. I had no resume, nothing. So it sucked, like so many coaches. I would go to tryouts and I would kill it, but then they'd look at the guy that was from a better school or whatever it was and they'd be like, yeah, we're gonna take him. He's got more experience, he's played. Yeah, you were I'm like, undrafted, right? Undrafted. I, I was cut by like six or seven PDL teams. Like Came to the Revs and did his PDL thing, sucked. Though. I remember playing PDL. Oh, I ended up loving PDL, but yeah. it took me so long to get there, you know? The reason why I hated it was I went, because I was thinking about going to Notre Dame, and I went up to Indiana Invaders, and I remember working on a factory line, dude. All I did all day was put gloves in a bag. And I was just like, this is my summer vacation. What am I doing? Almost got my leg broke. You played yeah. up there? Am I supposed to know yeah, what PDL I'm is? For like PDL is US, now week. USL League 2, but it's uh, basically okay. semi-professional. So it's like a feeder league. It's a feeder league. Here, bro. Okay. Yeah, it's like, but mostly it's made up of college kids. Like, okay. you, can get a quick, you can get a quick buck and play. Uh, at night, but I my job was I was working a I was working for a company that uh, like would set up your big inflatable floats and uh, you know slides and moon bounces and all that. Too. Yeah. Oh my god, we go to the warehouse at like five in the morning, load up the truck, drive to wherever we need to drive to. It's me and like my boys, you know, drive to wherever we need to, set everything up, and then man them like while these kids are all like going down the slides and everything. Like you know, kids are going crazy because. It's so much fun. Pack, pack everything back up. Those things are heavy, by the way. Oh, yeah. Put it back in the truck, drive it back to the warehouse, and then I'd go straight to training from what, there. So like, you, this is part of it. Like, it's a whole thing. You have to have a job so, on the side. Some, some, it depends well, on the club. I didn't have to. I, I played, you played PDL, too? Yeah, at a Westchester, New York. You played for the Flames? Yeah. But you they, can't, cut you, they cut me. They cut me the three why, times, bro. The, the Westchester Flames cut me three times. The reason why I had times. to do it, because you had to be able to pay for your rent to stay somewhere. So if what you were, kind of money are you making in that league? I mean, you'd be surviving. Okay. Macaroni and uh, spam, ramen noodles. Like, you're, oh. you're just trying to survive. Yeah. Like, I wasn't making, like, I wasn't get, buying nothing. I was just surviving yeah. to play there for two weeks. Five dollars an hour. I was, I mean. I was factory line. So I wasn't balling out of control. Like, I, I, I don't remember. Yeah. Like, I was like, all right, get paid. Oh. And then I was like, damn, where, I, I really got to set my game up. Yeah. Like, I was, I was <laughs> set, like, it's probably 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh -huh. every day. And I made $75 a day. Like, if I worked that, it was solid. Okay. But it was, again, for 12 hours of work, it's like six dollars an hour. It's like less than minimum wage. So. Should have been on the bouncy castle. You chose the wrong job. I was yeah. messed up. Yeah. What the heck? <laughs> but also inflation. You know, I'm a little younger than him, right. so it's like. Yeah, Where are you making? How much are you? Seventy-five making? a day. Oh damn. Yeah. So it wasn't bad, but it's, again, twelve hours of work, then straight to training. Whew. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's and I had guys on my team that were doing that, and they were doing Ramadan. But that was like, again, like I played in Newark. And like just the cultural, where I'm from, it's like, you know, one race really. You, know, you get a little bit of exposure to others, but coming into Newark, and I became so much more multicultural, so much more aware of like the the shit around me, the people around me. Personal different question: religions. You're Jewish, aren't you? Yeah. Do you, are you observant? Like what? ish. You okay. Know? Yeah. Like my mom's Catholic, my dad's Jewish, oh, and okay. I cel kind of celebrate the holidays of uh, of both. But the rites of Judaism, like, goes through the mother's line. No. Yeah. But like it's not like one of those things that's sort of, it's, it depends on the values that like are instilled in you. Okay. Was it your grandma that was Jewish? So my grand, my great grandmother uh, emigrated from Lithuania during the war, you know, for like fled religious persecution. She came to Ellis Island, New York, and you know lived the dream that way. Um, and I, basically, my grandfather, we had to move him out of his house, and I found like these old like emigration papers from her. So my dad and I were able to reinstate our citizenship. So I actually also have a Lithuanian passport. I actually big... contacted the Lithuanian FA. Like I was like, I want, I was like, I want international games. They were going through like a Euro qualifying cycle. How long ago is this? 
this was uh, 2000, after my first year, like really playing for the Revs, so this is 2018. I'm like, I reached out to Lithuanian FA. I'm like, hey, I have this, I have my passport. I'm reinstating my citizenship. Um, I would love to get in touch with my roots, which is true. Like I would love to like go to Lithuania, but obviously COVID kind of like threw a huge wrinkle into everything. Mm -hmm. But I would love to, you know, get in touch with my roots and be there and, and feel the culture. But also I'm a, a soccer player and I want to represent the national team. They were about to do Euro qualifiers and I think they were going to play England and Portugal in the window. I'm like, this is my opportunity. <laughs> if I can get in there, then I'm going to play against England and Portugal. And all I need is like, a crack, a crack in the door. It's all I've ever felt game. like. Yep, and I'll ball, and then I'll get my move. And but they never, they never text me back or email me back. Oh, they regret that decision. Yo, well, but you just played the World Cup I for know. the U.S. That's crazy that in a period of five years and you, you could go from that England. point to him. I know. And, and, you're, did, and right? you're playing in England at the time, which is crazy. Yeah. Because you had to deal with that all the way up. Yeah. Until... You want to know what? Like it wasn't that. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't bad at all. My teammates like. I don't like get affected by that, you know. Like they try to talk shit or whatever, and I'm just like, yeah, but you well, you're not out. playing, and you're not playing. Yeah, you shut them out. Too. Yeah, I did, I did. That felt so good. Oh, I felt so Sorry. good. But it gave me street cred around like around England too. Like people will see me and they'll be like, ah, oh, great game, you know. And uh, like kind of like brought us into the society. I, bet I think that was y'all's best game at the World Cup, honestly. No doubt. Yeah, it was, it was that, I mean, that, we played, that, above, we, like, played okay. at a, we played at a, a, a level and a rate that I feel like we proved to ourselves like what we were doing at the time was the right fucking thing. And like, and it, then it locked in. And now you see it. When that team gets together and we're playing in our region and we're playing in big games, like you see like these kids are becoming more mature and like putting in like more professional performances. It's so, I'm so blessed to be a part of that. But yeah, I, it was funny because like I, I like made a, what did I do? I fucking went on the, <laughs> I went on the journey. I dribbled, dribbling into the midfield, dude. And I like, then like dumped it off. And we almost scored on the play. We actually should have scored on that play. Do you remember that when I like dribbled in? Mason Mount was like pressing me. And I took a touch. I looked up, the ball was on my left foot. I'm not seeing the options. And I just, I dribbled. I think I took two or three dribbles into midfield. They closed inside and I played outside to, uh, to Jedi. And we almost like went down and scored. Like we really should have scored in that play. It was late as well, you know? It was like yeah. one of those hold now, your breath now moments, he says you know? That, I do remember that. You know, it's like one of those I, hold your breath moments. Yeah. I heard him Why like chasing me down. Why were you thinking, what earth am I doing this far up the pitch? Honestly, like I heard him chasing me down. He was breathing so heavy and I'm like, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm not used to that, you know? <laughs> you guys must hear people like breathing heavy all the time. I'm not used to people being near me like that. Not only breathing heavy, like on you, like yeah. grabbing you. <laughs> That's what, yeah, exactly. Anyways. I think it's weird if we talk about 20, uh, 2022 World Cup and we don't ask you about the situation with Greg and, and Gio, how did that affect the dressing room? There is no way it couldn't affect it, the it, dressing room. It's funny because you just say there's no way and I feel like it didn't. Like I just, I don't know. I know Gio and I know him well and I, I love the guy and I know Greg and I know him well and I love the guy and I just think it, the whole thing was just a terrible situation really and... Uh, I think it was like a misunderstanding like or... I think that's part of, I think obviously had to be, because, right? Because like... For Why me, did it have I, to be a misunderstanding? I, 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 because I don't the this. relationship, like, you know was me. there. You know what I mean? Like, the, they had a pre-existing relationship. So I just think that the heightened emotions of the moment just made every and sort of the come down from it just made everything sort of spread like wildfire. But I just, I just feel like you know that'll get resolved the way it should get resolved. And uh, but was it a situation like where? Obviously, Gio's had injuries, right? So he has to prove that he's fit to even play, to even for, sure. for that even to be a situation. Yeah. But and that's is it come is it coming in though and being like, all right, hey, guess what, man, you're not gonna play, or is it like, hey, if you prove that you're fit, you'll play? Like, do you know what that discussion was? I, I can't like speak to that discussion because I don't know exactly what was said in those in those chats. But I mean, you know how it goes. When you're hurt, you have to come back, prove yourself, and not only to the coaching staff, but to your teammates. Because then imagine like you just get thrown in and like the guy that's been fit, been playing, ready sub. to go, and you know you have to yeah you use up a sub like everything is so valuable and like maybe some decisions that were made were uh, you know obviously difficult and maybe incorrect. It's like but hindsight's cool. twenty twenty. Yeah, for you feel sure. Me? Like we're looking back and we're saying now Geo in that ten position. Oh my God, he had never played there yet. You're gonna you know is that, B, that? is that uh, B J? 
Oh, well, he was. It was kind of like the way it was trending. You know, we. I think like that's probably his best. Because Hudson on the already field. had changed that before. Yeah, he had already made that. I think, oh, okay. but, but again, like you can think about from Greg to Anthony to BJ, it's all the same stuff. The same conversations were be ha were, were were being had. You know, it wasn't necessarily like this organic idea. What? Oh, what if we did this? It was like, but can he be in that that position at the World Cup, off an injury, and run as much as the? Have you ever seen how much those tens run in that? But they're not having to sprint all the time like the wingers do. No, they which do. Which he had a history of the hamstrings. Yeah, it's true. But the, the tens, like the, they have to get out wide so much and cover the, the channel out wide. It's yeah. tough. Like but again, I, I, I say hindsight, 2020. It's easy to say now. Oh, we could have done this, that, the other, X, Y, Z, A, B, C. If we did this a little different at the time, you're just like. But what I, from my perspective, seeing how Greg handled that situation, it felt to me that Gio had an expectation to play regardless. And when he wasn't put in the team, because Greg said, you're not good enough right now, you hadn't played that much, you're not fit, that the team respected Greg for that tough decision. Is that fair to say? I think that's fair to say, yeah. Because coaches have to make tough decisions at all, all points. And by the way, like that team is, like that locker room is so rock solid. So again, we were all gonna respect whatever decisions that were made. Like, that's just the way that we were. And then, you know, you take the culture is that you take the role that you're in and you do it to the best of your ability. And that's the expectation from the within. Whatever your role is, whatever it might be, you do what you have to do to make this team better. And whatever the coach says goes. And uh, yeah, so I think, I guess that's fair to say, you know. Again, I don't know every in and out of every conversation. And uh, I don't want to like speculate either. So. I, I think um, it, I'm I know just you glad said it didn't. I know you said it didn't yeah, affect yeah. the dressing just, room, right? But you guys must have had the same reaction as a lot of us did, where you're like, when this whole thing like unraveled, afterwards. when you're like, dang, this is absolutely yeah, wild. Yeah, but then you see, you turn around and you see that, like he gets rehired, so like people still want to play for him. Okay. And people still want, like players were involved in those conversations. Mm -hmm. So were you involved in them? I, I had had I had a few. I definitely had a few, and that felt good to be in that convers in, in a conversation, you know. Really, Where I that, always yeah. thought it was weird to be in those conversations. It, 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 like, when, like the president of the Federation would reach out to you and, and want to talk. Like I was always like, nah, everything's good. I'm happy, everything's good. We had a good, you know what I'm saying? Like it's never like, I'm not gonna be the person. If you did that, can you imagine what I did? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Like it was, sure. it was good to be in the conversation, but I'm yeah. not telling them what to do. I'm yeah. like, look, I'm not gonna for, tell you for what sure, to do. For sure, because but... it almost felt Why? like. Why? Why not express a preference? I don't understand that. Because you don't want the pressure. I don't want to. I don't that. be the cause of somebody yeah. else not to lose their job exactly. or have their job. You know what I'm saying? Like that's not sure. my job. I'm not getting paid to do that. I'm paid to represent my country mm. and ball mm -hmm. as hard as I can. And when they call me, but you have I'm thoughts on what's best for the team. For sure, you have thoughts on what's best for the team. You know what I'm saying? Like I thought. You know, Christian Pulisic should have played in the semifinal game against Argentina. But did I go to Jurgen and tell him that? No. I mean, it's not my place to to say there's times you have thoughts and it's not my job. I just go out there and try to do my thing. That's so it. So you get a call from CBS and they say, hey, you know, you want Pete to still lead this. What, what you going to say? He's doing a good job. You know, like, like, <laughs> <laughs> like honestly, like I, I, got, I got a call from like, I think it was Sunil at the time, after Copa America, asking about Jurgen. I said, yeah, man, things were, things were good. I thought we did well. We got to the semifinal of uh, Copa America. The only thing is I wish we did a better job of keeping possession and taking the game more to our opponents. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But I thought Jurgen did a great job. And, and, and that was it, because that's the truth. We got to a mm -hmm. semifinal, and it was going to be a mountain to climb to try to beat Argentina. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, that's what I said. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to like, it's cool to be respected your that, opinion, exactly. but at the same time, it's like you're exactly. not trying to be that guy that's all in the videos. <laughs> What's that shit? As, as <laughs> oh, <he's doing> <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to dive more into the Ramsdale competition between you and him. How, how does that dynamic work? Because that's another thing. Keepers, they're, it's weird because you work together, but you're also, you want to be the one. You don't want to be the number two. Of course. And I think you went to Arsenal 
because you believe in yourself to be the one eventually given the chance. Yeah, absolutely. And I think over the years in my life, I've found myself in this sort of position many times. So whether it be high school, college, first couple of years at, as a pro at the Revs, what, our national team, now Arsenal, um, I've sort of developed the, what feels like the right way to do be in the position that I'm in, which is like you're pushing hard and you have to sort of bring it every day, but also you're supporting. So I have like that right balance of, I'd say, support and push. Um, and it's again, you know, feeling it out, feeling out the relationship between the two, uh, the two. And I don't want it to be like a spiteful thing because at the end of the day, whether it's a national team or for Arsenal, when you're on a team, you're a part of something like way bigger than yourself. So I don't want to just be a locker room guy. I said that I want to be able to contribute and help the team. So that, that's because yeah. I'll tell you right now, I'm not I'm not fucking settling for that. I know you ain't settling yeah, it'd be for that. Tough to be I, a I, I can't, I, as, I can't as be. No, I, can't I know that you're, but I also know that you're a fighter too. You know what I mean? You're a competitive person, and Listen. you and you know how to find that right balance. And for me, I think I didn't find that right balance. And also. I think is a tough situation for you because how I felt when I was over there is like when you have a player that's in your position from that country, I think you can't be just as good as that player. You have to be significantly better to win that spot over them. It's a good point. And that's it's, why I feel true. like it's such a hard position for you to be in in that because that's how I felt. Whether I was right and wrong in thinking that, that's just that's just how I felt when I was over there. Nah, didn't, you're right. you, didn't you he's break he's a right. window when you didn't start? Yeah, I did. What? I don't know this story. <laughs> All right. You do. All right. No, I don't. Oh, it was really? a it was a Euro uh, Europa League game, right? And normally, when players had come back from injury that were in the starting eleven, they kind of like go right back. When they, once they proved that they were fit and they came on as a sub and, and played well or whatever, then they got you know got into the team again. And for me, I was there for like five years and it's or four years, and it felt like there was a new coach every season, right? So it was like always I got put on the bench having to prove myself. And then that situation, I feel like I always didn't get right back into the team. So they called me up before the game versus uh, Juventus at home. And they're like, oh, you're, you're gonna be starting. I'm like, yeah, I know. Like, I, I normally, that's what happens when you're in the starting lineup before you get injured, <laughs> come back, you should be starting. Yeah, thanks for the heads up. I'm always ready to go start. And I get there and it's like, oh, you're not gonna be starting now. Mm. I'm like, what? And then I was in there with like Roy Hodgson and uh, no, it was the it was the Hamburg game. It wasn't the Juventus game. It was after the Juventus game, and it was going into the Ham Hamburg game, and we we're at home. And he's like, you know, mate, it's not like you've been pulling up any uh, trees lately. And I'm like, what the fuck do you mean? The gold versus Juventus? That was a damn giant red oak. Like, mm. it's not like I haven't been doing anything. Like when other players come in here. Uh, from being in the starting lineup, they go back into the team. Like, why is that not the same situation with me? You think I'm just going to be a, a good soldier? Y'all got me fucked up. And so I go out to the locker room, <laughs> and this is where I fucked up, where I'm not as supportive as you were. I said, you can't tell me this, living, you motherfuckers in here better than me. And then I said, boom, I hit through this window that's like played it. And then I pull my hand, I still got the scar right here. And, and I pull my hand out, Jesus. and I was like, Oh shit, I fucked up. I <laughs> fucked up. I went to Dixon too. I was like, look what they made me do, bro. Look what they made me do. And like it was like messed up like so bad that like I needed to go get surgery. And I was lucky that it didn't completely sever the ligament or I'd have been like a long press process of being out. But we had like another game versus West Ham. If you ever see me do that celebration, I was like, motherfuckers can't see me. Like after I scored, like I was always. <laughs> I just always had that chip on my shoulder feel yeah. like, man, they, they were just doing me wrong or whatever. But, you know, that's just how I was. So, yeah. like, it was a good part in terms of, like, it, that competitive nature, but it was a bad part because sometimes I think I rub my teammates the wrong way of not having that balance. I get you. Yeah. Have, have you ever felt that kind of anger? Absolutely, yeah. I, it's, again, I always say, like, don't get fooled by the smile. You know, like, you can see it out on me when I'm playing. Like, I, I have it inside of me, you know, but... Also, I have to be realistic with how I came up and what I've gone through to get to where I am. And not to say that I'm just happy where I'm at, but just like, okay, like it's taken this every step of the way to kind of get there. And I have to be a good person. And I have to be a good professional. And I ha like, that's kind of how I feel. Like it's helped me to g continue to move forward and to push and to get better and to challenge myself and to get new opportunities 
was, you know, being a little bit different, not somebody that they're going to be worried about, like punching through a window of, of glass and rubbing his teammates the wrong way. You know, Do, they, does they, it surprise you to hear that Clint? No, would act no, because like I've heard stories. I've heard stories. <laughs> you know, legend. when he was at the Sounders, people talk about you know the way you were, you know, just on the training pitch. And yeah. listen, that was that was you, and that's who you are. But yeah. for me, like that, I don't think that would work for me to go into a new locker room to bring that type of energy. Yeah, at least yet. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, at least yet. To be fair, it was never a new locker room. It was like years of being yeah, there that's and true. built up like, oh, hell no. Nah. Yeah, you fair know enough. what I'm saying? No, that's fair. Talk about the leaps and bounds that you've taken between 28 and 29. Like, what are some of those main areas that you think you've been proved in? Proved in? Yeah, I think it's just generally like my reading of the game. Yep. So my... I need to still improve my first touch, you know, my, the delivery on my passes, blah, blah, blah. But the way I read the game now is so much different. I'm so much more proactive. I, I anticipate a lot more. I can see things happening on the pitch. How I process the information is all happening at such a faster pace. And I had this same sort of like learning curve, I'll call it, when I went to New England the first time. Like, not necessarily tactically, but I'll just talk about the speed. Like, I remember getting scored on from about, like, 16 yards away. Like, somebody shot it, and I just couldn't, like, react in time. And went th it actually went through my legs. To some extent, that learning curve that you're talking about comes from the lack of, like, your history in the game, which For you sure. talked about, right? Because initially you were playing baseball. You were playing, what was the other sport Basketball. you were playing? Basketball. Basketball? Yeah, I played... And you used soccer as a means to, like, stay fit, essentially. Yeah, to for... be honest, like, I played American football, basketball, and baseball. I'm from a small town in Jersey. And, uh, yeah, I was the best player in my town. I do believe you because I saw you hitting a uh, bat in practice. You were hitting home runs. That's right. At Cardinal Stadium. So I do believe you. But I, I appreciate that because it's been, like, a huge part of my story for so long about like, oh yeah, you know, I played baseball. I played baseball until I was 18. I like li literally was, it was the sport. I've, I think still to this day, I What played, position did you play? I was an infielder. I've okay. played baseball more years in my life than I've played soccer. Why are even you playing soccer? Day. Why did yeah, I? Yeah, why, like, why make the switch? Because when that World Cup happened in 2010, I just thought to myself, oh, like there's nothing that made me feel the emotions I felt than watching that team in 2010. Like, I've, I watched every sport. All I ever wanted to do was play sports, sports broadcaster, sports announcer, professional athlete, whatever it was, just get into the game somehow. Coach, athletic trainer, something. And uh, again, I, so I, wa I was always watching sports and I was always watching whatever shows were on, highlights, anything. And, uh, but nothing, again, nothing captivated me like that 2010 World Cup. And I just remember the emotions it made me feel. And I thought to myself, like, there's no, there's no other sport like this in the world. Like, 100%, I'm locked in. Then I started going on YouTube and watching videos. Because the only way I could make my high school team was as a goalie. So I played, like, on my freshman team, JV team as a goalie. Then I'm like, nah, I'm going, I'm going for this. So I started watching, like, random YouTube videos of... Um, this is crazy like, dude, to me. It was, Why? It was... Someone who... Oh, is, it's an insane story, yeah. Yeah, in high yeah. school, having to, you don't have a coach. So you got to go on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> learn yeah. how, to, how to be a goalie. So I, Dude, I don't even know. Do we when we're gonna? Do we even have YouTube? No. 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 Had the dial-up internet. Dude, I don't even have an email. Uh, was there a game at that time? When I was in high school. You still barely have email. Was there a game <laughs> at that 2010 World Cup or or a player that? Yeah, you had? I mean, for sure, it was like Landon Donovan's goal against Algeria. Like just the emotion that me, like I was watching. <laughs> Honestly, it's killed Clint. I'm sorry, Clint. It wasn't that badass goal versus England. It was. A, <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> but no, <nah. laughs> that's fucked up though. Oh, uh, but I mean, yeah, that's a great, that's a great memory. But th that the was Algeria a Jubilani. Game was dope, man. Yeah, that was a Jubilani goal. Yeah, he got Jubilani. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, that 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 goal was the one that sent me really. Me and my friends, we would come to my mom and dad's house and we'd watch all the games. You know, it was like the three games or whatever it was. High school. And. Uh, and then we go down to the field just to kick the ball around. But eventually, once I got locked in, I was like, to my boys like Vinny and Pete, yo, Vinny, Pete, and they're like, you know, the, it the Italian stallions, you know, I'm like, meet me at Memorial Field at this time, like, I gotta try this or that, you know? So I was like watching old Peter Schmeichel videos, like an eight minute compilation. I'm like, watch like 30 seconds of it, think about it a little bit. I was like, all right, like, okay, I need you to hit the ball right here. Cause he did this thing where he dove and he actually caught it and just like brought it to the ground and it looked so cool. Like I want to try to do it. And then I would just try to recreate that stuff on the field. Like 
and I'll just watch it and recreate, watch and recreate. That's, that's a cool to hear you say yeah. that because most of the time when I think about goalies, I think they want to get it and push it out oh, for yeah, a corner yeah, yeah, kick yeah, yeah. and be like, <laughs> cameras, <laughs> yeah, get that, that shot as opposed to just making it look simple, keeping possession. I know, you know that, I mean? for some reason that's what spoke to me because playing all these other sports, like you have to catch the ball, you have to like process it, you have to do different things. And uh, yeah, but then it, I still couldn't like kick the ball. I couldn't take my own goal kicks until I was like 19 years old. Oh, so, damn. you know, I was like to my center back, like any, any game I was in, like mm -hmm. I was that guy, you know, oh, like damn. I needed my center back to come take the goal kick. So, cause I couldn't even You're kick. You're like, oh, I'm growing. Yeah. That's my growing. I didn't, even you know have, I didn't even have the technique and I had, I had the same size feet then that I do now. Damn. Like I was five foot 10 <laughs> with like size 14 or 15 shoes, like trying to kick a ball. Like. Twenty twenty six home soil, right? Is that excitement? Is it pressure? How are you experiencing uh, kind of the build up to that? Absolute excitement, you know. I, I believe that ninety four was like the biggest spectacle ever at the time. I can't imagine what twenty six will be like, you mm. know. And yeah, I think this group has expectation to uh, of how they're going to perform on the field, and uh, you know what we can do to sort of keep this train going like keep people getting more and more interested in the sport, keep the grassroots bit going, get it more accessible to more people. And I think people will see in 2026, again, the insanity of the market that is soccer. I mean, you see it every time these, the European teams come over to play in these friendlies and anytime, I mean, it's the only country in the world where you can play a home game and play an away game. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like sometimes we're it's playing crazy. on U.S. soil. Wild. If you play El Salvador, if, back in the day. yeah. If you play El Salvador in D.C., forget about it. You're not you're not playing a home game. You're playing. Mm -hmm. But you know what I'm looking uh, forward to, honestly, bro, is Copa America. This is gonna be fun. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If y'all can play like y'all played in the Concacaf Nations League, how you did against Canada and Mexico, against an Argentina, Brazil. Colombia, you know time. what I'm saying? It's gonna be a great and Ecuador, yeah. you know what I'm saying? I mean, those th that's those what th I want to see. I want to see y'all tested against better competition and and, and see how y'all do because that's what's gonna make y'all go on a deep run in the World Cup. Again, and that's that'll like m more experience for players. Like I've never, I don't think I've ever played a South American team. Like I've never, I've never had that. Mm -hmm. Imagine me going into a World Cup quarterfinal playing a South American team for the first time. So like, I've played in Europe, I've played it. So like getting more exposure to different areas of the world. Like I'd have loved to got that opportunity to play against the best in South America. When I grew up, that's what like influenced my game the most. That's what I, I wanted to play like Valderrama, Fastino, Freddy Rincon, like Diego Maradona, like Some Claudio Canigia, Fern dropped. Fernando Redondo. Like <laughs> I used to watch dude. all that, you know what I mean? Like playing right. against these yeah. countries, these teams at their stadiums. 2007, you got the chance. I got to go to Venezuela and I was like, the first game was Argentina and it's Crespo, Messi, Zanetti, Cambiaso, Raquel May. And I'm thinking, that we play that team? It's all just like different. Getting more and more experiences like that, uh, I think will be good. But Copa America, like again, first time playing South American teams in a tournament in front of fans, that will be crazy because you know- you get those an fans, idea of that pressure at home. Exactly. Exactly, it's gonna be so, and then you can see who can sink and, and who's gonna swim. And that'll be like a really good point to go, okay, this is what we have, and this is what we're gonna build for the next two years going into the World Cup. You know, and I, yeah, it'll be, it'll be awesome. Copa America's gonna be sick, dude. Yeah, yeah, you got to play wait. one of those. Yeah. I can't wait, yeah. Fire, dude. It was an international game where you did your gender reveal, was it? Yeah, it for was. your second baby? Yeah, yeah, it was. So yeah. you're having a girl? Having a baby girl, yeah. Which Looking is gonna to be it. your first girl, you already have a son. Have a Easton. son, yeah. You're obviously, you're a girl dad. You have three of each. Sons and daughters. Two hat tricks. Is, is, it, is it different? Is it different kind of pressure being a girl dad? What should he be ready for? Yeah, I mean, they'll have you wrapped around their finger. I think you're, I think you'll be more tough on your boy than you are your girl. That's just how I was. Everybody's different. Um, but like the girls will melt your heart. They'll take care of you when you get older. You know what I'm saying? And it's just different. You know what I mean? But yeah, it's at the yeah. same time, it's, you love them the same. You'll die for them. And it's, if there's what heaven is like, I think it's 
being with your kids. Oh, Clint. So. Thank you very much for that. That was that really deep. nice. Hey, man, sometimes you got to. It's getting loose. Um, it was interesting to me talking to your wife earlier and hearing that you guys have had a couple of miscarriages, just to know how much it now means you've gotten to this point and, and she's much closer to giving birth and feeling like, man, it's happening for us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's tough. I mean, we like to try to talk about it as much as possible because I think it's like one of those things that people don't speak about a lot. Because it's certainly I men. I don't right? know why. I mean, especially men, but you know, women sometimes too, um, because it's obviously super, super mm -hmm. personal loss for them. But then men, because it's so personal for the women, it's hard for us sometimes to be able to talk about it and like relate to them and understand exactly how they're feeling because uh, we didn't have that same. I'll just call it physical experience or emotional, like physical attachment beforehand so yeah it's tough I mean men men go through it as well and then I found that the more I've talked about it the more I've other related people, I mean other people the amount of the people that have gone through the experience well, I went through it too when I was a kid one in three women that's what I mean and when I was a kid I'd never heard anything about it it was like taboo you don't talk about it mm -hmm. but then after just being a, a lot more open I found people even coming up to me and like being like yeah you know me and my missus like had had a miscarriage and uh, like, how did you do this or that? And, you know, just that, that conversation alone, uh, I'm so grateful that we've been so open about sharing because that probably helped mm -hmm. uh, them get through a little something, a little rough patch. So that's, that's the kind of stuff Amen. that, that's the, that's the reason we, we like to talk about it. You know, you said one in three women. I feel like that, that's the kind of thing that people say to you almost as like a comforter, like, hey, yeah. this happens to so many people. Was, it, was that because that was something you were in shock? That yeah, that I was happened surprised to you guys? about, you know what I mean? I didn't know what the numbers were. I just know that it happened to us, right? So mm. then when you have something, that you do more research and you start to understand it. And like you said, go through it. And it's, it's just part of life, you know what I mean? You're grateful for the things that happen. And that is what it is. It just makes things, you know, appreciate the things that you have. I mean, mm. I had a sister who passed away, you know what I mean? Like life is short. Like yeah. Yeah. you just got to make the most of what you have, but you want to understand like why things happen or what caused it, to just be more educated on something. And like you said, talk with other people who've had those experiences. The more you talk with people about it, it's just, it's just good to kind of get people's stories and it kind of brings peace to, to those situations. Yeah. Is sure. it hard as a man to know how to like comfort a woman who's going through that? Which like you said, we didn't go through the physical experience, right? So For sure, you yeah. can maybe feel somewhat removed from the grief. It feels less like, I don't you know. feel the grief, like I'd say for me personally, and everyone's different. I felt it in a in a different way. Uh -huh. Like for me, it was sort of like after I felt like I helped my wife get back onto her feet. Right. Then I had my time to okay. like really deal with it. But in the moment, you just kind of got to be numb because you just you have to survive. You just got to keep going, like right. survival, like we talk about, and and. Uh, yeah, that, that's just, that's the way I, I dealt with it. But sometimes, yeah, I've, I've been through a lot of loss in my life, you know? Like, I've lost ugh, aunts, uncles, grandparents, cousins, whatever it is, you know? So, mm. um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, you learn how to deal with it in your own way. Mm. But also, I think it's really important to be able to, uh, to talk about it as much as possible because then you find people that you can relate to and who have gone through it and people that actually understand the emotions. And that's that's the most powerful thing is like we forget sometimes like that human connection. Was that something you had to learn like going through those previous think, losses yeah, that I, you didn't know how to deal with? For sure like I think my mother, <laughs> God bless her, she, she's been through probably more than anybody that I know you know and she, she lost a sibling when, she, when he was eight years old and you know stuff like that mm -hmm. so she, she has been through so much and but I still see her show up in a way for people that I have never seen from anybody else. Like, it feels like she attracts people that are going through a tough time sometimes. And, uh, you know, she's always there for them. So um, I've definitely learned a lot from her mm -hmm. in, in that sense of how to be compassionate, how to relate to people, how to be there for them, how to show up for them. And uh, yeah, she's just the, she's the best mom. And all of us would say that about our own mothers, but that's how I feel. I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. Thank you. It's very cool of you. Thanks, yeah. Uh, we had a game that we wanted to play. So okay, let's play the game. You want to play it? I mean, sure. Okay, so have you seen have you seen our Champions League show? Mm-hmm. You have? Okay, so we play this game called In the Mixer. It's just like yeah. rapid fire kind of questions. All right. 
Ready? How, do you, how do you think Pete's doing in that show? <laughs> Pete's doing great. Okay. Pete's, right. I never cool. say anything Thanks bad about sure. Pete. Pete, you're doing great. You you're not going to say anything to CBS anyway if they call. I'm going to say Pete's doing great. Jel I'm hired. Jelani, yes. you're doing great as well. That's my retirement plan right there. Thanks, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we moving into TV? Potentially. I think right. I'd be okay. I like. I think. I mean, not great. okay. I think I'd be great. Oh, oh yeah. damn! I think he I'd be great. Hey, man, if this guy was chocolate. Yeah. He'd eat himself over here. <laughs> <laughs> After all that we've talked about, that's what you get from this. Hey, you know, <laughs> friends can make fun of each other. Nah, you know, nah, friends nah. Now. Okay, I like that. Circle of trust. Yeah. Top three songs in your pregame playlist. Uh, okay. This is uh, they're all J Cole songs. Um, Pride is the devil. Uh, I think it's Middle Child and Can't Get Enough. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Clint, yours would have been what? My three songs? Yeah. I, would have, I mean, I like to jam something from Texas. I'd probably, something by Trade the Truth. It just reminded me the, of where I grew up and what I had to go through and, you know, the stuff against all odds, Trade the Truth. That's I like what that. I would play. I like that. First thing you bought with your first big paycheck? Uh, whew. What's on your wrist? It was when he was in. Uh, That's not. I, I didn't buy that. In no, Europe, okay. yeah, for sure. I would say there was a, there was a vehicle or wash bag. Uh, what? The first. No, a I'm not a vehicle a guy. Bag. I'm not a vehicle. I'm not a vehicle. No. Those person. are like the three things you get over there when you get into the locker yeah, room. Yeah, wash in bag, vehicle, vehicle, wash bag, and, and what? Watch and, a, and watch. watch. Yeah. Those are the three things. Um, no, first big purchase was probably my uh, wife's engagement ring. First big contract. First, nice. first big purchase. Oh. Yeah. We got a tester. <laughs> <laughs> That's dope. Uh, what show would you want to guest star in? You got a favorite show you're watching? Um, the MLB Home Run Derby, maybe. I don't know. Oh, okay, I'm not nice. really a big show guy anymore. Okay, or well, Succession. Why not? You want to flex? If you played, if you actually did a Home Run Derby, how many do you think you could jack out of the park? I think I could I, I could hit over 10 in the time limit. What but I would never get the bonus. Like, what? you get a bonus now if you hit one that's over 440 feet, and I don't have that So how in my far locker. are you hitting it? I think I, put, I, th I think I put one, like, 390. So how far, like in golf, when you hit a drive, how far do you think you hit the ball? If, did I hit it straight, or do I slice it like I slice it? Let's just say a time? straight one. If I hit it straight, I hit, like, over, well over 300 yards. Yeah. What handicap do you play off? Uh, like, 25. So okay. I'm not a good golfer. I can just hit the ball a mile. I have no no control of like where it's gonna go. I just can't putt really. When you when you okay. took batting practice with the Cardinals, that same pitch is that the same style they do. That's for how, home? yeah. That's exactly how they would do it for the wow. home run derby. They'd get somebody to throw. Uh, it's got a little pop to it. So because you need a little bit of velocity to to then generate enough power. At least I did. Have anyway. you done it ever before that time? No, that was the first time I hit in that style, but. And that was probably the first time I picked up a bat on a diamond in 10 years. So, so you didn't practice before you went out there? I actually think that was probably the most proud my mother's hey, ever been. Hey, hand on heart, you didn't practice before you went out there. Hand on heart. You didn't call the okay, Italian no, okay, stallions. Okay, wait. No, no, no. no, no, no. no, no. Hey, Vinny, get, get the bat. Vinny, Vinny, get the, Vinny, get the bat. Yeah, he would have got the wrong idea, Vinny, if I said get the bat. No, I, I... So basically what happened was I wasn't going to hit on the field, but then I was hitting in the cage underneath, like just swinging, messing around. And some of the guys were like crowding around, like, because I met a few of them, and they're like, oh man, are you gonna hit on the field? And uh, I was like, no, they're not letting me, but they lobbied to get me to yeah. be able to hit on the field. So I probably swung at 10 pitches and hit four home runs. It was pretty, it was pretty yeah. good return. Did you just That's say that was crazy. your most proud athletic moment? I think, no, no. First of all, for soccer players everywhere, I think that was a big, a big moment because I it was a that, flex. You know, it was a flex. That was a flex. Was it a was flex. a flex. But I think I was the most proud my mother has ever been of me. I don't even think oh, I could do other things. My to mom the was track. like, because she my mom played softball. Have you like, played I before? played baseball I mean, for I, so I long. Grade, I um, <laughs> took hitting lessons all growing up and everything, and it was kind of like she felt more invested in that. Yeah, one. when I decided to play soccer over baseball, I know she was definitely upset. Now, obviously, she's not upset, but. So for me to be able to still go out and do that, I know yeah. she was really proud. It's been cool to have you with us. We're looking forward to seeing you in the Champions Thanks League. Thanks, I appreciate yeah. you. I gotta appreciate do the proper it. dab. There we go, there we go. Oh, that's a punch of that. Oh, yeah. No, I didn't. No, that was a lot. But I, I thought maybe. Take a look at a sneak peek of next week's episode of Kicking It, Carly Lloyd, part one. Look, I didn't let my guard down much. I couldn't because I couldn't trust anybody. That's the reality of it. I mean, everybody looks at the US Women's National Team and they think, 23 best friends, everybody gets a lot. No, it's the most dysfunctional group of players, but the most unbelievable environment to ever be in.
Because How's that you, work, though? Because you win. It, Dysfunctionally in what way? It's, it's, it's unhealthy. It's, it's the, you know, the, the, the grinding, the having to compete for spots, the who's getting deals and, you know, what person's on a commercial this week and next. I, I mean, it's just, it's human nature. Thank you for watching. If you liked this episode of Kicking It, then don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to enjoy more raw and unfiltered content from me and the boys.